Here's a weird thing. Compasses used to not work around here. At least, not the ones you're probably picturing. The reason why helped turn the U.S. into an industrial powerhouse. And I'll unpack that. But what I actually find more interesting is how people got around this compass problem. Surveyors in the 1800s were charged with dividing this land into perfect squares. And we still rely on their maps today. But how do you make a map when you don't really know which way you're going? Well, you invent something new. It's story time. First, a quick refresher on how a magnetic compass works. So you probably know the deal with magnets. Magnets have a north pole and a south pole, and the north pole of one magnet is attracted to the south pole of another. I just pulled these off with my bulletin board, so they're not super strong, but you bring them close enough together and they stick. Well, a compass needle is a magnet, and effectively, so is the entire planet. There's a bunch of swirling molten metal in the Earth's core that creates a big old magnetic field. So besides having a geographic North and South Pole, Earth also has a magnetic North and South Pole. And in a bit of a twist, the magnetic South Pole is actually close to the geographic North Pole. So how does a compass work? The North Pole of a compass needle is attracted to the South magnetic pole of the Earth. And so a compass points North. Now, here's the problem. If there are other magnetic objects nearby, your compass needle might start drifting toward those things instead of pointing north. And suddenly, you're off course. Actually, I might, I might have a compass downstairs. Let me go see. So I've got this old compass. I don't think this is actually pointing north anymore, but for sake of example, let's say this compass needle right here is attracted toward Earth's south magnetic pole. Well, if you've got some other magnetic objects nearby, if you bring that too close to the compass needle, it is no longer pointing toward Earth's south pole, but is pointing toward whatever magnetic thing is nearby. That is, that is really cool and interactive actually. Now, Unexpected, cool demonstration aside, this was not a hypothetical issue. This was a problem for people trying to map the early United States. Especially in the upper Midwest, they kept finding that something was throwing off their compass needles. So what did they do? How did they make good maps? Well, many government map makers apparently just shrugged it off. According to one source I read, they basically just dealt with it, whatever that means. But one map maker, at least, was different. His name was William Austin Burt, and he was not about to fudge anything. To set the stage, Burt was born in 1792, so the very early days of the US, and he loved science and navigation, to the point where, as a teenager, he repaired a broken compass and used it to survey the land around his family home. To oversimplify a bit, Surveying is basically involved map making. Eventually, Bert becomes a professional surveyor, and in his early 40s, he's appointed United States Deputy Surveyor. His job was to go out and make maps for the government, dividing the country's new territories into a perfect grid of townships and sections. And he did a lot of his work in the Michigan Territory. The plan was to divide this land into townships of six square miles each, and those townships would be lined up with two reference lines, one going east-west and one north-south. If you live in Michigan, you might actually be familiar with these reference lines without knowing it. The east-west line runs along 8 Mile, and the north-south line sometimes pops up as Meridian Road throughout the state. Regardless, the real point here is that Bert was good at this and was not content with sloppy work, even if the territory he had to map was buggy, swampy, rocky, heavily forested, or sometimes, somehow, all of the above. And this brings us to September 1844. Here we'll pick up Bert's party in the Upper Peninsula, trying to draw a line south from what's now Teal Lake pretty close to where I started filming this video. As the story goes, the weather was cold and supplies were low. The team was eating porcupines they'd caught the day before. Overall, it was rough going, and the increasingly hilly terrain did not help. But then, one of Bert's crew called out that his compass was going wild. It wasn't pointing north, 
It was straight up spinning. In response, Bert called out, boys, look around and see what you can find. And what did they find? Iron, a lot of it. And so much of this iron bearing rock was magnetic that it seriously threw off their compasses. In fact, it was almost impossible to navigate in this area using a regular compass, let alone draw those perfect surveying lines. So what did they do? Well, I mentioned that this was a problem throughout the upper Midwest, and William Austin Burt had already run into this about 10 years before in what's now Wisconsin. Much like in the Michigan Territory, magnetic minerals in the ground were deflecting his team's compass needles, creating errors in their work. And again, Burt was not about to accept sloppy work. So he gathered up his loves of science and navigation, and he invented a new kind of compass that didn't rely on the Earth's magnetic field, a solar compass. I recently had the chance to visit the Marquette Regional History Center and see one of these things in person. And it is a complicated looking little piece of equipment. You know, Bert's first compass was in 1836, mm -hmm. and then he improved it. So this is an improved compass, and it dates around 1846. This is Joe Whitler, the curator at the History Center. She gave me a great introduction to the solar compass, but I really wanted to understand exactly how this thing worked. So Joe took me up to the research library and gave me access to the manual Bert wrote to help surveyors use his compass. These books are from the 1870s and really helped me understand what was going on. Also, I built a model. It's a little rough around the edges, but I think it really helps. So here's the deal. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west, right? So with those two facts, it shouldn't be that hard to figure out which way is north. But here's the kicker. The Earth is tilted, about 23 degrees. This means that the path the sun takes through the sky, that all changes every single day. If that sounds weird, think about how much lower the sun is at noon in December compared to in July, at least for us northerners. Or if you're extra savvy, you might have noticed that the sun rises and sets farther to the south in the winter than in the summer. Well, all these pieces on the solar compass are to compensate for those changes in how the sun moves. Like this is where you set your latitude, how far you are from the equator. Right now in the winter, the farther north you are, the lower the sun peaks. You can calculate latitude using the sun, and surveyors would have known how to do that. Next, you set the sun's declination. Practically, this is how far to the north or south the sun rises and sets, because it almost never rises perfectly in the east and sets perfectly in the west. The declination changes every day, and you can look it up in a table. Finally, you set the time, which, of course, affects the position of the sun. Now, setting the time is slightly more involved than just checking your pocket watch because of time zones. Like, Marquette, Michigan is way farther west than Portland, Maine, but they're both in the eastern time zone. So at 7 o'clock, it could be pitch black in Portland, but still twilight here. It's the same time, but the sun is at a very different place in the sky. So for this, you use something called solar apparent time, which is ultimately based on how far east or west you are. Once everything is calibrated and set up and you've jumped through these hoops, all you have to do is rotate the compass until the sun hits the center of the silver plate. And when it does, the compass's arms are now pointing true north and south. And all this because there was too much metal in the ground to use a magnetic compass. Despite their initial complexity, versions of Burt's solar compass became standard instruments used by government surveyors across the country. They were used to survey about 75% of the public lands in the U.S. because they were fairly cheap and were accurate. This saved the government millions of dollars and led to many maps that are still informing property lines today. And this compass that was invented in the 1830s it was widely used up until the arrival of GPS more than 150 years later. 
But earlier, I mentioned that compasses used to not work around here, where I'm standing, and that this specifically led to a discovery that helped turn the U.S. into an industrial powerhouse. Well, the solar compass allowed Bert's team to map and navigate this area south of Teal Lake. Just to the east of here, actually right over there, is where they found that iron, and they were able to accurately record its location. And here's the big thing. While they may not have been the first to know about this iron, they were the first to make it widely known that this part of Michigan is full of the stuff, or was at the time. This public discovery led to many mines on what's now called the Marquette Iron Range, which since the 1840s has produced millions of tons of iron ore. That iron was used to grow industry in the 19th and 20th centuries, support troops in major wars, and is still being mined for American steel production today. The story of iron mining in Michigan's Upper Peninsula is much larger than just Bert and his solar compass, but this is a part of the story I never knew about. I never thought about how all this metal would affect navigation, let alone all the hoops you'd have to jump through to find your way a different way. Thanks as always for being here and for joining me on this increasingly snowy afternoon. I hope you learned something that makes you think about the world just a little differently, and I'll see you soon.